We're going to pick up right where we left off. We've been journeying through the book of Joshua. For those of you that don't know, the book of Joshua is in the Old Testament. And it's the great story of when God took the people out of Egypt and they began their journey into the promised land, into the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised to them and to the descendants of Abraham, to Israel. And so Moses is dead. He has fulfilled his calling for his generation and has died. And now Joshua has been chosen to lead the people of God, to lead God's people into the next new season. Last week, we looked at three ways that God is calling us as a courageous people like Joshua and the people of Israel to be courageous in the earth, to be courageous in being and courageous in focus and courageous in trust. Were you, were you, guys, uh, were you guys down for that last week? Today I want to look at how the Lord equips his people to accomplish the mission that he gives them and and us as a courageous people, but also as an equipped people. Say an equipped people. God wants you to be equipped. He wants you to have the right armor and the right weapons and the right tools to fight the battles that you are uniquely called and created to fight. And as a church, God has called us into this region, into this place, into this city to accomplish some unique things. We're going to get into that a little bit more today. If you have your Bibles, go to Joshua 1, verse 10. We're going to pick up right where we left off. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people to pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions. Say, prepare Prepare. your provisions. For within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go and to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. The title of my message, for those of you taking notes, is Prepare Your Provisions. Prepare Your Provisions. How does God want us to prepare for what he's calling us to do? That's the big question that I hope to answer for all of us today. And I want it to be helpful but also spiritually beneficial to you. When you think about preparation, what comes to mind? When I was a kid in high school, I remember preparing for the SATs. Now it's the ACTs, right? Anybody have to do that? Anybody do the the prep classes for your SATs or ACTs? And I hated this because it meant I had to go to school on Saturday. Any of you guys have to do this? Or just me? A, A few of you. And I had to take these prep classes where they teach you stuff that you're really never, ever going to use again in your life. Anybody feel me on that? That's kind of most of school anyways, right? (laughs) Like, who remembers the Pythagorean theorem? A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? I had to jog your memory, though, for a second there, because you you almost forgot. But your mind is full of all of this useless information, unless you're an engineer, a scientist, or a mathematician, maybe a doctor. You're never going to use it ever again. And so I'm preparing for the SATs, I'm studying, I'm cramming, I'm doing all this stuff to try to get a better score so that I can get into a better college, right? Well, at least that was the thought. God had other plans for this guy. (laughs) Didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. Anybody feel me? And truth be told, that's life. But how many of you know that as a prepared person... I was set up to succeed at what I was trying to do. I didn't walk in the day of and open up the book. Now, some of you guys are master crammers. Any of you guys ever do that in school right before a test? You just start looking over the notes. You just start cramming. Now, I learned in college, later in college, that I had a really good short-term memory. And I could just view my notes and retain it all for about an hour just long enough to fill out the Scantrons. Who remembers filling out Scantrons with the number two pencil? Where's the number one pencil, right? Or the number three, it's always a number two. They gotta have a number two pencil. Gotta fill out the Scantron. And I love multiple choice, because that means that I could, you know, get it right. If If there was an answer on the sheet that recalled or triggered a memory that I had of what I saw when I crammed. But how many of you guys know that right after taking that test or preparing for the SATs, all that information was gone. I couldn't tell you today half of what I learned and or tried to remember in those moments of cramativity. Let's just call it that. I was cramming and I was doing the best I could. But I wasn't really prepared. 
I just was cramming. I was just trying to last minute jog things into my memory. What about you runners out there? Any, any marathon runners or triathletes or uh, people? Like nobody in this room. No, no. We, yeah, all right. We got one in the back. Oh, we got two. Okay. How many of you that do that would know it would be foolish for you to approach your marathon the way Pastor Jason approached his tests? You don't show up to run a marathon trying to cram, right? Well, I think I'll just stretch it out a little bit. Don't want to pull a hammy, you know, get my stretch on. Did you run at all? No. No, I didn't train. You didn't train at all? You didn't lift any weights? No. No, I ate McDonald's. But I'll be good. I'm just going to cram. I'm just going to get out there with everybody else, the Boston Marathon, and I'm just going to stretch a little bit, and then I'm just going to go. How many of you guys know things wouldn't work out too well for me? Maybe, because I'm just naturally that gifted. And No, I'm just kidding. But life is like that a lot of times. It's a, it's a marathon it's a race. It's a, it's a, Paul talks about it as a race that all of us are called to run. And how many of you guys know that you can't run your race well if you're not well prepared, if you're not well equipped? For any of us, we look at that and we go, yeah, that's silly. Why would I not prepare if I was going to run a race? But do we have the same mindset toward our calling in Christ Jesus? Are we adequately prepared for the mission that God has given us as a church? Are we adequately equipped to fight the battles that he wants us to fight and to win and to overcome at in life? Today I want to look at three ways that I believe God is calling us to prepare our provisions for the mission that he set before us to accomplish. Are you with me? Let's take a look at the first one. Number one, you got to take inventory of what you have. You got to take inventory of what you have. This is all about, at this stage, being honest in your assessment of yourself. Paul says it this way. He says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. What is he saying? He's saying, be real. Be honest. Now, here's the thing I want to ask. Do you have people in your life that you can be honest with? People that know you, K-N-O-W, and know you, N-O. People that know the real Jeff Palmer and the real Stephen Swank. And the real Megan Murray, do you have people outside of just your spouse that know the real you? Or outside of your boyfriend or girlfriend that know the real you? Do you know the real you? you got to be honest in your assessment of yourself. And I think this begins by recognizing that God has created all of us, each one of us, uniquely with different spiritual gifts and physical talents. Do you guys know the difference between your spiritual gifts And your physical talents, your physical talents are what your mom and dad gave you. (laughs) You inherited them by birth. Congratulations. Your spiritual gifts are given to you at your new birth. When you become a new born-again believer and his Holy Spirit comes to live and reside within you. And I want to talk a little bit about spiritual gifts this morning as we take inventory of what we have, of what we're working with. Romans 12, verse 6 through 8 says it this way. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Did you guys know that God has given each one of us in this room today different spiritual gifts? Well, that's what the text says. That's what Paul says, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And because we have these different gifts according to the grace of God, right? Grace means gift. Charis in the Greek. It's the gift of God for you to possess spiritual gifts. But not just so that you can have them, but so that you can use them. If prophecy, he continues, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. I love this passage of scripture because it means that all of us get to play a part in what it means to be the people of God and to utilize the gifts and the talents that we have. Now, oftentimes when you come into relationship with Jesus, Jesus will redeem your physical talents. He'll, He'll redeem your abilities, your natural aptitudes, your characteristics, your temperament, all those things to support your spiritual gifts. And what I love about this is this was not meant to be an exhaustive list. So 
for the sake of papyrus and time, he put into this some great examples for us. But I would like to think that that list probably goes on and on and on and on. For the one who cooks in her cooking. For the one who mentors in their mentoring. For the one who rides bulls in their bull riding. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Whatever God has given you the gift to do, do it. Use it. And I believe in this next season as a church, God wants us off the sidelines. He wants us engaged in the game, in the fight, in the battle. Amen. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. It's a long one, but I want to read it. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but same spirit. All right. So all of us have different spiritual gifts, but they come from who? The Holy Spirit, which means they are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're not your gifts, as if they're just all yours. No, they belong to him. And he's entrusted them to you so that you can steward them wise and steward them well. He says there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common Good. Verse 8, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit. Who does what? who apportions to each one individually as he wills, as he wills. You know what I love about this scripture? It means that God saw your life and saw you and and thought, you know what would be great for Kayleen? I'm going to handpick some spiritual gifts for her that I think are just going to come alive in her and that are going to come alive in Lori and that are going to come alive in Megan and Maddie and Amy and Liam and Cora, my kids who are not talking in the back. God saw fit, according to his will, to apportion to each of us as he saw fit. If you've never taken inventory of your spiritual gifts... One of the things that we'd love for you to do is to be a part of our Courageous class, our Be Courageous class. We're going to be doing our next one September 25th, the week after our grand opening at 12 noon. We're going to host it downstairs, and we're going to have food and child care. And this is an opportunity. It's an hour-long class for you to come and learn about some of your spiritual gifts. You'll take a spiritual gift assessment. For those of you that have been with us for a while, you guys remember when you did that? It was a lot of fun. You know what's really cool? Going back and looking at that and going, oh, I almost forgot. Right? So some of us have multiple gifts, and it just may be that you've been really strong in one area, but now in this next season, God wants to grow you in, in another. Amen? So come join us for our Be Courageous class on the 25th. We'll help you discover and grow in your spiritual gifts. So you've got to take inventory of what you have, what you're working with. Number two, don't focus on what you don't have. Don't focus on what you don't got. In other words, don't get sucked into the comparison trap. The comparison trap comes for us all, especially in this day and age of social media. Am I wrong? Come on, people. Am I wrong? No, I am not wrong. But here's what I've learned. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison will steal your joy. I'll tell you what, nothing steals my joy more than hanging out on Instagram too long. Right? Because you start looking at stuff that you don't have. Start looking at these nice houses. I, I liked a couple of my, my wife's real estate posts, and now all of a sudden I see all these real estate agencies posting beautiful homes, beautiful kitchens, right? All these just amazing stoves and just all the stuff that you could dream about, right? And before long, you're looking at that and you're like, hmm, why don't I have a kitchen like that? Why don't I have a backyard like that? Why don't I look big and strong like Matt? Why don't I have my act together like Taylor? What's wrong with me, right? And don't we do that? We start comparing ourselves, and then the joy that we had 
all right, let's see what's going on in the world today, it starts to fade. <laughs> because comparison is the thief of joy. It'll also distract you from your assignment in the kingdom of God. Comparison doesn't just want to take your joy. It wants to distract you. It wants to pull you off course. It wants to get you not utilizing your gifts and talents that God's given you, but looking at and drooling over and envious over somebody else's so that now you're drifting off course. Now you're out of your lane. Now you're not even running your race. Now you're over here and you're jealous and you're envious and now you've got strife in your life and chaos and whoa, what's happened? Comparison has come for you, which means that you have to know your role. What do I mean by that? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 goes on to say in verses 14 through 18, same passage. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body either, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, verse 18, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. So once again, God chooses gifts for you, and he chooses roles and functions for how you are to fit within the body of Christ, which is amazing to me. But that's not oftentimes how we live our lives. We live our lives interested in what other people are doing. Or we say to ourselves as the foot, man, I wish I were a hand. Or as a hand, I wish I were a foot. But don't they have equal value, different, unique, but equal value to the health and help of the body? Absolutely. In the body of Christ, we have to reclaim this. Otherwise, we're going to miss out on what God wants us to do. We're going to miss out on our role. We're going to miss out on having impact in the life of another person. The time that we get together is sacred and holy unto God, and we love it. But it's just one hour a week, which means that you have been given the opportunity as a member in the body of Christ with unique gifts and talents, with a unique role and function to make an impact wherever you are. Isn't that awesome? But I want you to catch this little part here before we move on to the next scripture. God, go back one, God chooses. God arranges. Some of us think we actually play a larger role in this than we do. But it, it, the truth is God wants to fit you together. For those of you that are in journeying with us as Courageous Church, God has chosen this for you. He's appointed and arranged this for you. Yeah, sure, you jumped on Google, you saw the directions, you saw the fancy ad, you bumped into somebody who told you how awesome Matt and Taylor are and Pastor Candace is. But the truth is, the Holy Spirit had a whole lot more to do with it. And I can, you guys, I can testify to this because for over 30 years I've been following Jesus and I can tell you looking back in the rear view of life, all the ways in which God was opening doors and making a way and appointing and arranging and choosing how and when. And all of that should blow your mind, right? Like how God, he's God. He's that big. He's that capable. He's that intelligent. He's that able. And he's that interested in you. And he's that committed to your life. And he's that like, it's, if he knows the hairs on your head, if he, if he takes care of the sparrows and, and clothes the lilies of the field, how much more does he care for you? How much more, Jason's translation or paraphrase, how much more is he interested in your life? How much more is he all about arranging you the way that he sees fit? Well, that's what he says. He tells us straight up. Here's what Paul goes on to say back in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. He says it this way, For as in one body we have many members, thank you Jesus, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one, say one, we are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we're not just members of Christ, we are. We have our life in Christ, we're hidden in Christ, we're seated with Christ, we're redeemed in Christ, we're justified in Christ, we've put on Christ, we're in Christ, we're abiding in Christ, we're abounding in Christ. But guess what? We're also connected to each other. 
We've been fit together to be individual members of one another. This is why, as members of, each, of one another, God wants us to be healthy. Because one unhealthy part of the body affects the whole body, doesn't it? We say it this way, when, when one of us is weak, we're all weak. Or one of us is hurting, we're all hurting. Or one of us has a need, we all share in that need. Amen? This is why we need each other. God's, God wants a healthy church because he wants a healthy family. And we're not just members of a body, we're also his family. Truth is, God created us this way. He created us for community. He created us to share our life together. That's why at Creative Church, one of our core values, you've heard me talk about it before, is that we are called to be a family that shares life together, that does life together. So how do we do that? Well, every time you make a phone call, every time you text, every time you pray, every time you encourage, every time you offer a hug, every time you go out for coffee, every time you go and help clean up someone's apartment, every time you go and mow their lawn, every time you show up at the hospital, every, t- every time you show up and do what only you can do in your appointed role and function with the gifts that you have and the unique, unique way that God's created you, that's when you share your life together. The reason we need to understand our role The reason we understand our function is so that we can perform the way that we were designed to. Because once again, God wants a healthy body. He wants a healthy church. Amen. So we don't need to be distracted with what we don't have. Number two, we don't focus on what we don't have. And number three today, we got to trust God with the impossible. We got to trust God with the impossible. When we do our part, God does his. I've told you guys, for those of you that have been with us for a while, I've told you a story of my uh, South Korean New Testament professor that I had in college. And he said, Jason, when you do the possible, God will do the impossible. And I never forgot that. Because the truth is, God wants us to do our part, but he'll always do his. At the end of the day, God didn't call Joshua. God didn't call the people to do everything. He didn't say, go out and do everything and figure out how you're going to win the battle and figure out how you're going to take down Jericho and figure out how... No, he didn't ask them to do everything, but he did ask them to do their part. He said, prepare your provisions. In other words, figure out what you've got and use it. Figure out what you can do and do it. He calls them to prepare their provisions, to be obedient unto the law, And to trust that he was going to be their God and show up in a powerful way. Joshua 1, verses 12 through 13, says this. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, this was uh, uh, two two of the tribes of Israel and the half-tribe that had intermarried with Joseph's tribe in Egypt. Joshua says this. Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded to you, saying... The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest, and he will give you this land. You see, you guys, it was the Lord that was going to give them the land. It wasn't just them going in to take it. It was the Lord, his ability, his power, his promise in their life. It wasn't about their intellect. Some of you are like, thank God. It wasn't about their intellectual prowess or their abilities or their their emotions or their mastery of their gifts or talents. It was the Lord. It was God himself who was going to come down and help them overcome and win the war. I'm sure when they looked at all the land, as we'll come to see in future chapters, I'm sure when they looked at all the land and saw the challenges, saw the giants, saw the obstacles, saw the problems, they probably had their questions and their doubts. Like we do, right? When we look at our lives and we look at our bank account and we look at the bills and the mortgage and the things and the gas prices and we're like, oh God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? When we get looking at our ability, we become isolated unto ourselves. But when we begin to trust God to do the impossible, that's when our eyes become open to the reality that God is able, that God is willing that God can do all things, that there's nothing that's too hard for him, that there's nothing impossible for him. Amen. Jeremiah thirty-two seventeen says it this way. Ah, oh, Lord God. I love that word. Ah, ah, Lord God. 
It is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great, what? Power. And by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing. So here's what I want you to do. If you have a Bible or a piece of paper or your iPhone, take out your notes. And I want you to write in that space where it says nothing, something right now that you're wrestling with that seems too hard for you. Okay? Could be a health situation, it could be a financial situation, it could be a relational situation. But I want you to, to draw a little space, and in that space, I want you to write down something that's too hard for you. And then underneath it, I want you to write the same thing, and I want you to draw a line through it, and then write, is too hard for God. All of us have something in our life, if we're being honest, that feels a little outlandish, a little maybe too far, a little too difficult. But I'm here today to encourage you through God's word that there is nothing that you could write down, there's nothing that you're facing that is too hard for God. Tell you what, maybe you need to make a couple (laughs) lines, right? Maybe some of you got three or four things right now. And what I want you to do for the next week, the next two weeks, three weeks, I want you to pull that note out. You can attach a reminder to it if you're an iPhone user. I don't know about you Samsung guys and gals, but you can figure it out. See Steven. Steven will help you out. (laughs) He's looking at me, shaking his head. (laughs) Attach a reminder to it, and I want you to remind yourself over the next few days and weeks that this particular issue, whatever it is, is between you and God, that it's not too hard for God. It might be too hard for you, but it's not too hard for him. Amen? Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 10, verse 27. And Jesus looked at his disciples. That's all of us today. I want you to see Jesus looking right at you. And he said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Church, all things. He didn't say some things. He said all things. Do we believe that today? As a church, this is why we are a praying church. This is why we're not just a people that pray, but we are a praying people. We are passionate about prayer because we believe that when we pray, we do our part and God does his. We believe that when we pray, we do what we can do, and then God does what he can do. He does the impossible because once again, God can do all things. Amen? God wants you guys to be well equipped for the battle that's ahead. He wants you to be prepared for what is to come, and we believe that begins now. That, be- that begins when you and I choose to utilize our gifts and our talents in service of the king. It happens when we stop comparing ourselves or fighting with one another over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, right? It happens when we start believing God to do big and impossible things again. I wonder if that's your desire this morning. If it is, let me ask you these two final questions. How are you preparing your provisions? How are you preparing your provisions? Next slide. After that. And what steps are you taking to do so? What steps? What steps? I don't believe that God calls us to always make big, giant leaps, you guys. But I do believe that he's always calling us to take another step. Maybe for some of you today, it's just being willing to be honest with your assessment of yourself. Be honest and and look in the mirror and go, this is where I'm at, right? This is what I have. God, this is what I'm working with. Maybe it's some of you just signing off Instagram or getting off Facebook or, you know, Stop in the comparison trap, not getting sucked into that. Or maybe for some of you, it's being challenged to dream a little bigger and to have faith for something that seems outlandish and outrageous that only God can do. Whatever that step looks like, and maybe it's, you know, you just taking that next step and joining us for our Be Courageous class. I don't know, but I do believe this. God will show you if you go to him in prayer, if you'll take it before the Lord, he'll show you what that next step looks like if you're willing to take it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge to prepare our provisions to become a well-equipped people. 
Lord, we know this happens by taking next steps. So, Lord, wherever everybody is in this room today, Lord, you see them, you know them, and you're for them because you love them. Jesus, we're so thankful for your love. We're so thankful for what you came and gave your life to do, which is to give us new life and to give us a new hope in you. And so, Father, I just pray that in these next few moments, Lord, that you would just highlight, maybe even right now, just that next step for us. Whether it's being real, assessing the gifts you've given us, deciding to use them, Lord, stepping up to serve, reaching out to that friend or that loved one that just needs to hear from us, encouraging somebody, turning off our social media accounts and getting out of the comparison trap and just putting our focus back on you, Lord, believing you for big things, audacious things, outra- outrageous, outlandish things, Lord, whatever that looks like today, Lord, you're going to just show us right now, even in these moments. So I just pray that you would do that, Holy Spirit. For anybody here, Lord, that just doesn't know you, I just pray, Father, that they would open their heart to surrender all, Lord, to not take any more time to, to try to do life according to their terms, Lord, but to accept life according to yours. Because ultimately, God, what you have for us is good. And so, Jesus, we thank you for that today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for meeting with us again. Thank you for illuminating your word, for challenging us, equipping us. Lord, to go out into the world to fight the good fight of faith, to be well equipped for the battles that you're calling us to to face. If there's anybody here today that doesn't know you, Jesus, this is your opportunity to take a step toward him. The better news is that he's already taken a massive step towards you, and he did it when he went to the cross on your behalf. When he fought the battle that you could never fight and won, and when God the Father raised him from that grave, claiming his final victory over death and sin and the devil. And so if you're doing life according to your old way and you're trying to manage your life according to your own terms, I'm just here to tell you today, there's a room full of people here that have tried that and have failed over and over and over again. But there's also a room full of people here that have made the decision to go all in with Jesus, to accept him as Lord and Savior. And so I want to give you that opportunity to do that right now. I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. And if that's your heart, maybe you can, you can say this out loud. Maybe you can say it in your heart. But Jesus, Savior, save me. Save me from myself. Save me from the mess I've made of things. I believe and confess that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on that cross in my place. I believe that you were raised to life again on that third day. I believe that you have more for me, Lord, more hope, more healing, more freedom, more life in store for me. Come fill me with your Holy Spirit. I repent. I change my mind. I turn my back on my old life, and I'm ready to step into the light. I'm ready to step into the new. Would you help me? Send your Spirit to help me and give me a new life in you. In Jesus' mighty resurrected name, amen and amen. Let's put our hands together today. Thank you, Lord. So if that was you or watching online or listening to this podcast, please fill out that Connect card. You can do so online at CourageousChurch.com slash connect. Let us know about your decision. Let us know about the next step that maybe you're ready to take. Maybe that's getting more involved. Maybe that's being a part of our Be Courageous class. Maybe that's helping in our kids or student ministry or community groups or at our various city serve events. But you can fill out this card. It's actually inside that worship guide. Or you can go online and fill out the digital one that you see behind me. We'd love to know because here's the thing. We want to come alongside you. We want to help you. We want to put our arms around you. We want to help get you plugged in. We want to help you grow in your gifts and, and help you figure out where you belong in this body. Amen? And if not, we still love you. You're God's best. (laughs) Let's stand to our feet.